Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. I am so excited to have Melanie Perkins, the co-founder of Canva, with me live from Australia, from Sydney. Um, and we're taking your questions right now on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, and on YouTube. Um, Melanie, as, as many of you know, is back on the show uh, in January of 2019, I think. Um, such a cool story. Um, I think back in 2012, she, she basically flew from her home in Perth, Australia, to San Francisco she had one contact in, in the whole area and she was determined to find funding for this idea for Canva. Uh, today, it is it is one of the biggest online platforms for design. Um, and it's one of the most successful Australian startups over the past decade. Uh, Melanie, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's exciting to be here. All right, first of all, um, you are in Sydney right now at, I'm assuming at home or, or at the office? At home, yeah. At home, and how how are you doing? How's your family? How's Cliff, your co-founder and partner? How, how's everybody doing? Doing well. I think it's been, a, it's been a crazy time for the entire world the last few months. I think no one could have predicted, except for Bill Gates, actually did in two thousand fifteen. Yes, he did. <laughs> um, yes. What, what was about to be um, unleashed upon the world? Um, we're doing well. I think we've been lucky. We've been in a fortunate position that there are a lot of people who still need to design during these times. In fact, even more as small businesses are converting online. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been an interesting experience navigating it with our, with our team, uh, this whole world. Yeah. You know, um, Melanie, um, and I know most people call you Mel, right? They don't call you, even in your, in your videos, you go by Mel. It says Melanie, which is really Mel. Yeah. And I can't remember what I called you in the interview. Did I call you Mel or Melanie in the interview? Uh, I have no idea. Right. Either, or, either or is perfectly fine. Okay. Um, I mean, as you as you know, I mean, it, we've had a lot of founders um, come onto the Resilience Edition who've been on the show, and they've talked really frankly about the challenges that they're navigating right now. It's a tough, it's a very difficult time. It's the most challenging time for every single founder and CEO in the world. Um, so first of all, I mean, have you have you guys had to face layoffs? I know you, you had about 900 employees last time I checked. Have you had to go through that at all? No, we've been in a fortunate position that, um, we're, you know, we're, we're a profitable company. We had, you know, strong cash reserves um, and cannabis continued to grow rapidly throughout this throughout this time. Um, I think that the challenges of navigating, um, you know, from an on, off, offline world where we're all meeting and that's such a big part of our culture online, um, that has been relatively smooth, I guess, because most of our things were already online. We we're already working in an online world. Um, but I think that, what I really feel is a huge sense of responsibility. So while we're sort of a stable ship, you know, we've got so many students and teachers that are trying to navigate this whole work from home, work from school from home and world. Um, and that's it's such a huge radical transition. We have all of our businesses, um, you know, that small businesses across the globe are having such a challenging time right now. Um, and so we really feel a huge responsibility to do whatever we can um, in order to help these. Uh, in, in order to help everyone else across the globe. Yeah, and what about what about your your employees in Australia? I mean, are you are are you, are you able to go back to work yet, or are you still working remotely? So everyone's working from home, um, and we'll, at a certain point in time, we'll enable people to go back into the office to work from the office if they so choose. But we're not going to be making it compulsory work from off work from um, the office probably for this whole year um, yeah. to ensure that everyone can have that flexibility as they need it. Our, our, I mean, Australia is in, in a somewhat different situation than the United States and in most European countries. I think New Zealand hasn't had a case in, in days. Um, and I think Australia is starting to open up. School, schools are going back in, in session in some places. Um, are, are other businesses that you know of like going back to normal yet or not quite? Not quite. Um, still, the government's suggestion is to work from home um, and wherever you possibly can. And we really believe that's sort of doing our part to help continue to slow the spread, even as the cases go down. We certainly all don't want to see a second wave. Um, and so, you know, being able to have the, um, you know, not so many people on public transport or um, commuting or whatever it may be, I think is really important just to do our part. When we set out on this pandemic, not when this pandemic set out upon us, I guess, um, it was really important that we set out sort of our guiding principles. And the first one was our safety and well-being is the number one and most important thing at all times. Um, and so that sort of meant that we, you know, early March, our team started working from home prior to the government recommendations. Um, and then 
making sure we're supporting our community and then rallying together and growing. Um, and they've sort of been the three pillars that we've made all of the decisions for our company based upon um, in, in the months gone. Um, just a reminder, if, you've ha if you are watching on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, please submit your questions for Melanie Perkins of Canva. If you use Canva, if you have any Canva technical questions, here you go. You don't even have to write the tech support. You've got the top tech support person right here for you. Um, please submit your questions. Um, Mel, as you know, in the in, in Silicon Valley, like Twitter, I think, and Facebook and other companies, basically a lot of them said, we're going to offer work from home permanently um, because, you know, it's 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 become an option that has worked for some people. Um, I mean, is that something that you could imagine? I mean, is does um, does your team do you feel like your team really requires needs to have that face to face interaction to to be able to, to operate in an efficient way? I think the world we're all going back to um, is a different world to the one we set out on. And I think we something that we've always really appreciated about our company is our culture. Um, and, you know, our culture is really embedded you know, in our offices. We'd all have lunch together. There was, you know, have yoga classes, have, you know, all of these really important parts of our culture were sort of built between the walls. It's been a fascinating process seeing our culture being brought online um, in, the, in the last few months. And seeing how it's actually has transported really effectively online. So we are now have, you know, meeting much more regularly um, to ensure that context is being spread across the entire company. Um, we are we've had things like um, yoga classes online. We have uh, they, our chefs who are amazing. They can't cook for everyone anymore. But what they're doing is actually doing that online and teaching people to cook uh, special meals. Oh, nice. Um, there's been all sorts of wonderful things to see that have been sort of brought from the physical world into the online context, um, which has been very cool to see. Um, I think that what's very interesting, though, is that we need to ensure that we keep um, looking after our team, keep ensure, keeping ensuring that um, we are working together. And so whether that's online or whether the offices can open up, like being able to bring everyone back uh, into that, into the workspace, um, we'll be giving more flexibility, but we think that we'll sort of play that one by ear. Yeah. Mel, you know, we had Toby Ludke, Shopify, um, the founder of Shopify, on a couple of days ago and um, or weeks ago. And, um, and you know, he started his business at the during the last, um, well, his business really took off during the last financial crisis. And, and they weren't expecting it. All of a sudden, people were losing their jobs. They went and started e-commerce stores and then signed up for Shopify. And, and actually, their business exploded during that time unexpectedly um he's seeing a similar um he's seeing sort of similar growth right now just people kind of really coming to the site launching direct to consumer e-commerce um, businesses brick and mortar moving to to, to e-commerce um are you seeing a similar kind of growth with your youth with your paying customers are you have you seen all of a sudden a spike in, in people joining yeah rapidly so in fact I think there's a few factors of that. All you know, students, one billion students learning from home, um, I think has certainly helped to ensure that a lot more people are now using Canva, to, you know, being able to express their creativity, being able to have incredible online lessons. Um, it's been an area that we've really wanted to delve into is to how can we support students and teachers during this rapid transition? Um, and so we launched an education product. We've doubled down on all the education worksheets and resources and design education that people can take through Canva. And then also the same applies with small businesses. Small businesses have had, small businesses have had to go from offline to online in such a short period of time, if that was even possible. Um, and so people are navigating this and having to create social media content and marketing materials. Um, so I think, yeah, we've seen an incredible surge um, across both of those demographics um, through, through throughout this. Yeah. Um, I want to take a question from um, our audience. This is from Caitlin Pierce um, um, by Facebook. She's in Massachusetts. She runs a social media agency. Um, she loves your product. Um, huge help. She says, thank you. Um, she asks, what can we look forward to such as partnerships and features um, as a small business and as a business that supports other entrepreneurs? So that's her business. What, what can what can she look forward to in terms of partnerships and, and new features? Awesome. That's a great question. Um, so I think the, the most exciting thing we released uh, recently, we actually now have 50 million images as part of our paid product. 
Um, so what we did was we took, took our entire library and then we made that available um, at the same price point. And that I think was a really helpful thing for small businesses. So they weren't having to have, you know, purchasing other assets and that sort of thing. So all the illustrations, videos, music, um, and 50 million images are all available at that same price, which is kind of cool. And we've been seeing a lot of small businesses very excited about that. Um, there's so many more things that are coming. Our whole goal was that you can take an idea and you can turn that into a design um, and have zero friction between those two points. And so, you know, that's why we've been able to launch things like printing. You can now print your T-shirts through Canva. People are creating all sorts of hilarious work from home swag. <laughs> um, and I guess our goal is to continue, continue to ensure that the experience is as smooth as we possibly can. Um, and, yeah, there's some a lot more exciting things coming. So thank you very much. You know, we get a lot of questions um, on this in this platform about marketing, right? Like, how do you market right now when no one's going outside? And obviously, the, the obvious answer is social media and digital digital marketing. And I, I'm assuming a lot of or a huge segment of the people who use Canva are designing digital ads and digital assets for social media, probably, right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I think that you know, a philosophy that I've always held um, is it trying to provide as much value as you possibly can and trying to solve a problem. And uh, so rather than having ads feeling like ads or um, marketing materials feeling like marketing materials, trying to provide as much value and imbuing that with, with as much value as you can. And I think that that philosophy resonates now more so than ever before. People don't want to be so, sold to, but they want to be helped. Um, and so I guess that's why we've invested so heavily in things like our design school to help people to learn to design. Um, and in our education resources and materials. And so I think that, you know, for every blogger or small business that are, tr are trying to get their name out there, if there's different ways that they can actually help their community, I think now it resonates more than ever before. Now, I want to ask you to put your entrepreneur's hat on. Um, and I remember during our interview, um, you were taught, you, you, I mean, you did all these crazy things. Like you went, we went kite surfing to um, basically to be able to attend this um, investors conference. You know, you learned how to kite surf so you could go to this thing. Um, you came to San Francisco. You met this one investor. You knew nothing about him except he spoke to your college at Perth, in Perth, Australia. You went out there and you said, "Oh, yeah, I happen to be out here, and, and can I see you?" And, and you really hustled. Um, but you also described yourself as an introvert. Um, I remember you said um, you're, you're really naturally introverted, but when you have a goal, like you will force yourself to do everything you need to do to like achieve that goal. What, what, I mean, we get a lot of questions from in, introverted entrepreneurs, you know, who have a hard time asking for help or asking, you know, for, for funding or things like that. What, what do you, especially in this moment, like what kind of advice could you give to somebody who, who like you is introverted and, and maybe a little bit nervous to put themselves out there? I think that goal is is definitely paramount for me. When I have a goal, I think that everything else sort of fades into the background. My nerves might still be there, my, or whatever else it might be, that might be um might be a bit scary. But when I have a goal, I think I put absolutely everything I can in to achieve that. Um, so you're right. In the early days, it was trying to find investors. Now it's you know my goal is how can we support our community? We've got 30 million people around the world that are relying on Canva to help with their social media, to help with their marketing, to help with their education. Um, and so I think it's so important that we're able to support our community, support our team. We made a statement early on that we're going to ensure all of our contractors will continue to be paid throughout this recession, uh, throughout throughout this time. Um, and so I think that, that the, goal, the goal has still stayed the same. In the early days, the goal was, you know, trying to get funding. Now it's trying to ensure our team is safe and our um, community is supported. It's, um, so I guess the introversion just becomes suddenly it's faded into the background a little. Yeah. Well, you, you don't really have a choice now, right? You're, you're, you're running a company of 900 people and you kind of have to, you kind of have to fake it until you become it, I guess. Yeah. And I guess, so introversion, despite what it's, it's introversion, a lot of people think is being shy, but actually introversion is that where you get your energy from. Yeah. And so I get my energy, you know, I like, you know, just being by myself for a little or just with my partner. And so being able to have a little bit of time alone every day is pretty important. And I guess in this whole isolate, ISO world, I guess everyone is at home a lot more. Yeah. So maybe it's an yeah. introvert, introvert's world right now. So it's like you're drinking Red Bull all day. You've got so much energy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Um, we're getting a lot of questions about Canva, so I'm going to ask some some granular Canva questions. Um, and apologies, yeah. apologies if I don't ask them in the exact right way. This is um, from Zoe Theoni. Um, she's asking, is there any chance of editing Canva presentation in, in Microsoft Office? Why would you want to do that? I, I don't know. Zoe, why? I don't, Zoe. So you can, you can, um, you can click publish and then you can download it as a PowerPoint. Um, so you know, we do believe very much in being able to pull in everything and then pull out everything. At the moment, you can't do a lot of um, pulling in, but that is actually being worked on as we speak. Um, and then the idea is that you'll be able to publish out to anywhere in the world. And so, yes, you can publish out to Microsoft PowerPoint if you so fancy. Got it. There's a question from Sean Blinch. Um, will can I don't even know what this means, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Will Canva ever allow layers functionality? Uh, can, can we ask him for more clarification? I'd, I'm curious right. to know. We'll, get, we'll look for more clarification on Facebook, Sean, if you're watching, and then we'll we'll go back to that. Um, so he, here's a question about the sort of the business side of things, right? Because Canva is a has a freemium model, right? It's it's you can, and I'm sure a huge number, maybe most of your users are using the free version. It's really great. You have access to thousands of photos and a bunch of features. It's free, um, and then there's a subscription. I think it's like ten bucks a month, and in the U.S. and then. 30 bucks a month for a premium one. Um, but how do you, like Spotify offers a free a, a freemium version, but they have advertisements. So how do you how do you monetize the free version of Canva? I guess it goes back to what I was saying before around giving as much value as you can. Um, and so that's been one of our philosophies right from the early days was we want to ensure that people are able to get heaps of value from Canva and there's no blockers. And so we made Canva completely free um, you can go you can go and purchase some images you can upgrade to the free version but if you are wherever you are in the world whatever your economic situation we wanted to ensure that you had access to design um early on i remember trying to get a um, brochure design it was going to cost a thousand dollars i was like who can afford a thousand dollars for a brochure design um and i guess that's why we wanted to ensure that everyone had access to great design and so um it wasn't something that only a few people can go and afford and so I guess that's exactly why we have a free version. And it's so philosophically important to Canva. And essentially the free version is funded by the people who are paying for the subscriptions, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, talk to me a little bit about your, your sort of your leadership and, and how, I mean, I, well, I think I last saw you in San Francisco when I interviewed you in like the fall of 2018. The company is now valued at more than a billion dollars. Um, one of the biggest Australian startups over the last decade. Um, and you've got a lot of attention, a lot of visibility. Um, how is your sort of leadership and your your leadership style and, um, and just your own comfort level uh, at being a CEO and a leader of a big organization evolved? I I think that um, it's it, everything's just a continuous work in progress. You never are going to have all of the answers. Um, I think if I was dropped into a 900 person company with millions of people around the world using our product, that would be quite scary. But every single day, it's just like a few more people are at the company, there's a few bigger challenges. Um, and so you kind of just build up that muscle as, as we grow. Um, I think that the thing that I'm probably most proud of at Canva is seeing our culture um, and seeing how our team has been able to rally through this crazy period. Um, seeing which, like one day we, um, said, okay, we realized we're going to have to shut down the office. We're going to have to have everyone working from home, cancel my wedding at the same time. Your wedding. <laughs> it was a big few hours. <laughs> and then we, um, the next day we had an onboarding class. So we had 30 odd people that were joining Canva, but that was already transitioned to work from home. They were just on Zoom and we just, wow. it was just incredible seeing how rapidly we were able to transition um, to an online environment. But I think that behind that has really been our values. So, you know, we really believe in being a force for good. And I think that that has been something that we've been able to rally the entire team around. If we're rallying the entire team around just financial outcomes, I think that would be not that exciting for anyone to get motivated, especially as the world is in such a crazy place right now. Um, but being able to rally people behind um, big goals of, you know, being a force for good, supporting our community, um, I think that that is what inspires people. So I guess... I have always been very excited by goals, and I think that that has certainly translated across up to our company. Um, in fact, one of our company values is set crazy big goals and make them happen. Um, and so I think that's you know everything that we've done at Canva, you know, from structure to the way we you know onboard newbies and share context, has really been around 
helping to facilitate setting crazy big goals and actually making them happen. Um, this is a question from Jason Lee uh, via Facebook. Again, to put your entrepreneur hat on, um, you started this business in, I think you launched Canva in 2012, but you were, you had a, a tough time, like raising money at first, explaining to investors what this was. Um, they weren't quite sure what it was and why this was going to be useful. Um, and because you had a yearbook business before, and so it was a struggle. Um, so he asks, um, what, like, what, if you were starting this business now, right? Given given the uncertainty of what what's going on now, um, how do you think you would have approached it differently if you were starting something right now? Where would you even begin? I think the same place we began back then, and solving a problem that affects a lot of people, or even a really small number of people to start with, that solves their problem really well. Um, I think is as important now as it was back then when we started our first company. Um, an online design system to create school yearbooks. You know, we had no business experience, marketing experience, like any relevant experience whatsoever. And it was so critical that we just solved the problem really well, which was that school yearbook coordinators had a difficult time creating yearbooks. Um, and just like starting at that really small thing, starting niche and then going wide, I think is really important. Um, and you just have to like learn a little every day. And then you learn you know, every time, I believe in this concept of just-in-time learning. You kind of learn everything just in time or often just after <laughs> you need to know it. Um, and so I think that you know, starting a business today would be really similar to starting a business back then. You just have to find a problem, solve it well, and then just keep on learning as you go. You know, given that, I mean, when you started out, you were making you were making physical yearbooks, right? Like you were printing them. I think you were printing them out of your parents' house in their yeah, room. I remember. Like you bought them, <laughs> printing, or you donated a, someone donated a Xerox machine to you or something. I remember that, right? I'm, yeah. I'm, you know. And um, but now, I mean, especially now when people are are, are kind of shut in, things are distributed digitally. They're going to be distributed digitally more and more. They have been obviously for the last twenty years, but but it's, this is on hyperdrive. You can't you know, physically print something out and distribute it to people quickly. So how do you think sort of design, I mean, the design elements that you that you offer will change and even the approach to design will change as people kind of come to the realization that maybe physical, you know, products, objects that um, require design, you know, that, that require to be published won't, won't come in a physical form. Yeah, it's been incredible seeing just within our own community the transition, a really rapid transition of what they were creating. So they're creating less event invitations, they're creating less um, business cards, they're creating less flyers, um, all of the things that sort of really resonate with the physical world. And what they are creating way more of is things like Zoom backgrounds and presentations and um, you know, learning materials for you know, students and teachers um, and social media content to be able to um, communicate with their community. So that was a huge swing. It was almost overnight that, that um, the transition happened. So our marketing teams, our design teams, our template designers, um, everyone had to transition really on a, on a, on a dime to, the, to this new world. Um, to help facilitate all the new things that need, people needed to design. People are designing more, but completely differently um, to what they were di designing prior. So, like, what what's an example? Like, I mean, you mentioned obviously people aren't pr printing business cards and stuff, but what I mean, even in the way people are designing things, are you starting to see anything unusual or different? Yeah, just, just the, really the, the doc types, the things that people are actually designing um, has transitioned dramatically. Um, you know, even things like Facebook shops and setting up their e-commerce backgrounds and yeah. um, their e-commerce posts and ads and social media posts and, and presentations and infographics. Um, a really huge sharp spike in infographics as well. Um, I think that people are just communicating now in such an online fashion. Even um, the way people are creating and celebrating birthdays People are creating custom Zoom backgrounds or even when we look inside our own company at the way we've done things like previously when it was someone's anniversary, um, people would all sign a physical card. Of course, that is no longer possible. So people are signing um, digital cards on Canva now um, and then we send that around um, with lots and lots of gifts in them, <laughs> which is a bit of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, strangely, you know, a lot of people ask about how do you kind of break out in, into the marketplace when you're shut in. Um, but obviously, we're we're in this moment where people are, for better or worse, 
incredibly focused on social media. I mean, they are paying attention to things that are on social media because they're they're not out in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of people who are, you know, wanting everything from you know, feeling more connection to feeling more inspired to feeling there's a, there's a lot of people with a lot of needs right now. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, I have one more question for you, but I want to say hello to some people watching. Um, Hadas Avidor Golden in Israel, Gary Hawar in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Nancy Ellen Pedden in Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, I'm assuming, uh, Maria Stella in Chicago, Vera Almeida, New Jersey, Warren McClure in Flint, Michigan, Catherine Morse in Massachusetts, Melissa Siraz in Michigan, Delaney Huntoon in North Carolina, Joel Becker in Virginia Beach, Samira Koshnud in San Francisco, Debbie Klein in Calabash, North Carolina. Uh, we've got uh, Jody O'Donnell Ames in Titusville, New Jersey, and many others. Um, I've got a couple of quick announcements, and then I want to ask you one last question, Melanie. Um, this series is going to be back here on Friday at noon Eastern, um, 9 a.m. Pacific, our normal time. Uh, we've got the founder of Spindrift, um, Bill Creelman. He was on the show a couple months ago. Really cool story. Um, you can RSVP uh, to get reminders about these events by going to nprpresents.org. So check that out. You can see all of these conversations, including my conversation with, with Bill, in full. Um, if you missed any of it or you want to see it again, at uh, facebook.com slash how I built this or at the NPR YouTube page. And we also put an excerpt of them on the podcast. So look out for that. Um, by the way, speaking of the podcast, we have a brand new episode. It came out Monday. It's the founder of Duolingo. Do you, Mel, Mel, do you know Duolingo? I do. I've been trying to learn Spanish for a really long time. <laughs> got to hear the story. It's insane. This guy invented CAPTCHA that you have to type in to start a, to open up an account anywhere. And then he went on to invent Duolingo in, in, in between inventing another product that uh, allowed him to digitize books. And it's an incredible story. This amazing story. Luis Fanon, Duolingo. Check it out. It came out on Monday. Such a cool story. Um, tomorrow on your podcast feed, we're going to be releasing another episode of the How I Built This Resilience series with two incredible chefs, both Michelin three-star chefs, Daniel Hume and Kyle Connaughton. Daniel Hume of, of 11 Madison Park, Kyle Connaughton of Single Thread Farms. Um, they're going to be talking about how they've literally turned their kitchens into, into commissaries serving people in need. It's an amazing story. So check those out. Um, Mel, before I let you go, in five years' time, when you look back at this moment and you're like, oh, my God. That was crazy, but we became better and did this as a result. What is it you want to be able to say? I hope as a world that we, we come out of this um, more connected, more caring about humanity, more caring about every single person's health, every single person's um, ability to have basic human rights. That would be amazing. You know, from our community perspective, I really hope that we can come out of it and say we did everything we could to support the small businesses and the, the students and the teachers that relied on us, um, all, all of our community. And I hope on a team level that we were able to say that we did an incredible job of supporting everyone through this trying time, their mental health, their physical well-being, their connectedness. Um, I would love to be able to say that on all three of those levels. Well, I know that I've been um, watching my children, my son, work on his fifth grade school yearbook on Canva. So there you go. One of the billion students <laughs> shut at home. Um, Melanie Perkins, thank you so much for joining us from Sydney. It's so great to see you again. I, I you know, obviously distant, but um, so great to see you and congratulations on, on the success of Canva. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.